Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Maria Rosa Vaquerizo. I'm the CEO of the Andean American Associations. Uh, these were the first chambers of commerce that were founded in the US for the countries of Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. Uh, that happened around the 1920s and 1930s. And together, we have done about 93 programs. We have hosted over um, these 93 years, we have hosted over a thousand programs. So um, these chambers are, like I said, the first ones in the US. And uh, today we also have the privilege of uh, being in partnership with the North American Chilean Chamber of Commerce and the US Paraguay Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I would like to welcome our board presidents uh, today we have with us Stephanie Jongermoat uh, for Colombia, Juana Caicedo Selinger for Ecuador, and Ana Julia Hatar for Venezuela, uh, Manuelita Cody for Chile, and I also would like to welcome the Consul General of Colombia in New York, the Honorable Susana Berenguel, and the Consul General of Peru in New York, Ambassador Marita Landa Landaveri. So what does 2021 hold for Latin America? Will there be a meaningful recovery? What are the greatest political and economic challenges? Today we have a very distinguished panel of experts who will give us their outlook and what will happen, their expectations of what will happen the next year. I want to give a warm welcome to Jose Antonio Ocampo, uh, to Luis Oganes, Brian Winter, and our moderator, Evan Coster. Evan is a partner at the law firm of Hogan Lovells. Evan represents sovereigns, financial institutions, and corporate borrowers in Latin American debt capital markets, especially in the energy related transactions. Uh, they, they also specialize in restructuring. Evan has represented clients in leading sovereign and quasi-sovereign debt transactions in Latin America. Evan is frequently quoted in The Economist, Financial Times, Bloomberg, uh, Latin mag uh, Risk Magazine, and The Latin Lawyer and has written on topics related to the Latin American debt capital markets. For the Q&A, uh, there's gonna be a whole half an hour at the end of the program. So it's very important that uh, on the chat button, you send your questions. You can send them throughout the conference and then at the end, they will, um, Evan will pass it to, on to the speakers. Uh, with no further ado, I'm passing the floor to Evan and uh, he will introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria Rosa. It's a privilege for me to moderate uh, this panel. Um, I'm uh, a big fan of the work of the associations. I know you do great work, host great events. And um, again, it's a privilege of me to, to be able to moderate this panel. So um, a Latin American outlook for 2021 um, I think all of us would say, given, given what's happened in 2020, it, uh, it all, could only go one place and that's, that's up. So um, let's hear what our, our panelists have to say. Let me introduce them uh, in the order that they will speak. Um, uh, the first uh, panelist is Jose Antonio Ocampo. He's a professor at uh, School of International Public Affairs um, at Columbia University in New York. Um, he uh, is chair of the Committee for Development Policy of the US, UN Economic and Social Council and the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. Um, he um, also teaches at other universities uh, in Colombia. Um, he has uh, a, a background that is uh, uh, very illustrious and it would uh, occupy a lot of time to go through um, all the positions that he's occupied, but just to, to name a few. Um, he's uh, served in positions at the UN uh, and his native Colombia, including UN Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, uh, Executive Secretary of ECLAC and Minister of Finance, Minister of Agriculture, 
director of the National Planning Office of Colombia and member of the board of directors of Banco de la Republica. And I'm sure I'm um, omitting some of those uh, just in the interest of time. Our second panelist is Luis Oganes. He's the managing director uh, and head of currencies, commodities, and emerging markets at JP Morgan, uh, which he joined in uh, 1997. He manages a team of researchers that analyze um, fundamental and technical drivers for global currencies and commodities, as well um, as economists and strategists that analyze macro dynamics of emerging market economies uh, to identify investment opportunities in emerging markets, uh, including Latin America. Uh, he started in the uh, Latin American research team, uh, relocated to London in 2014, and then back to, um, to New York in 2016 and expanded his responsibilities. Um, to also manage the uh, G10 FX and commodities research team. We're, we're honored to have uh, Luis, who will give us uh, an overview of economic developments. And the final panelist is Brian Winter. He's the best selling author, analyst, and speaker. He's editor in chief of the America's Quarterly. Um, he has been living and breathing Latin American politics for the past 20 years, spent a decade throughout the region uh, as a journalist for Reuters. Um, he's based now in New York City. Um, he's the author of, uh, of four books with diverse topics as Why Soccer Matters, a bestseller he wrote with Pelé, um, The Accidental President of Brazil, which he co-authored with Enrique Cardoso, uh, a book uh, with Avaro Av Uribe, and uh, Long After Midnight, at, uh, one more about his time in Argentina. He's, he's um, a regular presence on TV uh, from NPR and CNN Espanol to the Wall Street Journal. So he will be joining us uh, shortly. Um, in terms of uh, the order, um, uh, uh, the, um, we will have each of the panelists will do a, um, a short presentation of 10 minutes. Um, and then we will have a, um, a, a spirited, hopefully, discussion for about 20 minutes, which I will lead, followed by Q&A. Uh, so please use the Q&A function uh, on the Zoom, uh, which will last uh, 25 minutes or so, and then some concluding remarks um, by Maria Rosa. So let's uh, get started. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jose Antonio. Uh, I think you're on mute, Jose. No. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Evan, and, and thanks very much to Maria Rosa for the invitation to be with you. Let me actually uh, put a PowerPoint presentation uh, for uh, that I will share with you, uh, although I might not be able to cover the, the whole of it uh, through my presentation. So let me uh, 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 try to uh, analyze what is the impact of the uh, uh, international context uh, on, uh, on the Latin American economies which I think is also, of course, important for the uh, for the, the story of the recovery. So th this is the main story uh, uh, I want to tell. Uh, the international shocks have been severe, uh, but actually not worse than in previous crises. Uh, there has been weak international cooperation, uh, but relatively good performance of private financing, trade, and remittances. Uh, the poor economic uh, domestic performance of the Latin American economies is uh, remarkable by itself uh, and comes on top uh, of the worst key Kenyan in history. Uh, and for that reason, uh, you can say that uh, despite the recovery that's expected next year and the, and the following, uh, uh, we're going to, uh, as I point out, uh, uh, to go through a, a lost decade uh, for Latin America. So the major issues are really national and regional and the capacity of countries to overcome uh, those uh, factors is what is important. So this is the worst international uh, the global crisis in history in the, since the Great Depression, uh, uh, with a, actually one characteristic is that the speed of the, of the contraction was worse and more synchronized than in previous crises. Uh, but there are significant uncertainties uh, uh, surrounding the international recovery, basically associated to the second waves. Um, now, in turn, however, uh, the, the story of the international context is actually quite a, a mixed one, as I pointed out in my first slide. So the, uh, the, there, is, there was a, a strong contraction in international trade, uh, a, a, but there has also been a strong recovery uh, a, since uh, the month of June. 
uh, and I will see that that is particularly so for Latin America. Uh, the, there's of course the collapse of, of some services uh, with tourism and air travel being the most important. So the economy that depend heavily on those uh, are more uh, significantly affected. In terms of commodity prices, uh, actually uh, the contraction has been concentrated in energy prices. The other commodities, which are very important for many South American countries in particular, have not been doing that badly. Uh, and remittances were expected to uh, severely decline, uh, but they have not done so. Uh, the, uh, the data that is available for January, August actually shows us an increase of close to 10%. It depends heavily, however, on the on the location of the economy. So the economies that depend uh, on migrants to the U.S. Uh, have done mo much better. For example, Mexico, uh, the migrants that depend on uh, on the Spain, Ecuador, for example, have been doing badly. Uh, and the worst are the economies that uh, the migrants depend on migrants to uh, to Chile and Argentina, uh, uh, because th those have or are Brazil. Those have se uh, severe contractions in remittances. So this is the story of trade in both in volume and value. You can see that there was a significant contraction in the crisis, but also a very strong recovery. Actually, you compare it with the 2008, 2009 crisis, the recovery has been much faster. So this is a less of a constraint. And in the case of Latin America, the story is very similar. The contraction was stronger initially, but the recovery has also been uh, very strong. So we are actually in, uh, in terms of volume of international trade uh, back to the pre-crisis levels. Uh, and in terms of commodity prices, the, the fall has been uh, the red line, which is uh, fuels, but non-fuels actually did not decline with the crisis, uh, and they have been actually increasing uh, in recent months. Now, from the point of view of capital flows, uh, there are a lot of uh, surprises uh, uh, during this crisis. Uh, the most important is that bond financing uh, in hard currencies uh, for emerging markets actually started to recover since mid-April. Uh, so the, the interruption uh, or the contraction was only two months. Uh, this is much strong, much faster than in previous crises. For example, in the 2008, uh, 2009 crisis, it took more than 12 months. In the East Asian crisis, it took about five years. Um, and the result of this is that uh, there have been a significant level of private financing. The, uh, the quarters two and three, which is where the crisis has concentrated, uh, actually, uh, uh, the uh, 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 regional actors uh, raised about $73 billion, which is about the same as uh, they had risen uh, in, uh, in 2019. The most important problem, however, has been with international co multilateral cooperation, uh, where the, the, uh, the credit lines have been very limited uh, in, in terms of use. And finally, there was a good renegotiations of Argentina's and Ecuador's debts in August. Uh, so the, uh, those that are two, the two most important cases uh, have the, been done. This is the story of the, the different uh, types of uh, uh, financial flows, but look at the red bars, the uh, sharp contraction in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in March, but also the recovery. Uh, and basically since, uh, since June, we have had relatively high levels uh, of flows into emerging markets. Uh, the others, the, uh, the other flows we are in, in uh, local currencies actually have also recovered in recent months, uh, equity being the most important uh, a problem. Uh, and, uh, and this is the story in terms of uh, uh, yields and spreads, according to the data from JP Morgan, like the previous one. Uh, you can see here that the initially there was a significant increase uh, in both, uh, but again, uh, much uh, weaker than during the 2008-2009 uh, the, the crisis, and much shorter particularly. Uh, so we are actually, in terms of yields, uh, back to the pre-crisis levels, uh, you know, which are uh, relatively good. Uh, in terms of financing uh, from the IMF, the, the resources have been quite limited. Uh, it, you can see here that it's only about $12 billion for, for the Western Hemisphere, uh, so much less than, uh, uh, than the private financing. Uh, uh, if we exclude the flexible credit line, the really important thing have been the flexible credit lines, uh, the, uh, the, the one uh, for Mexico first, uh, the one for Colombia, which was increased this year, uh, and the, the ones, the new ones for Peru and Chile. And in terms of, uh, 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 I just, I don't have data for the, for the year, uh, but you can see here that the two most important multilateral banks uh, are the Inter-American Development Bank and CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. None of them has been capitalized uh, and they do have limited amount of resources to, to lend. 
So the, the, the reason for the poor performance, in my view, are more uh, national and regional. Uh, the first one is that Latin America became the epicenter of the pandemic in June, August. Uh, now this situation is improving uh, in, in recent months, uh, and, uh, but it, had the, it has one of the worst uh, impacts in, uh, in the world context. Uh, uh, now, it, lost, it also reached a crisis uh, after a, a terrible quinquennium, actually, uh, in, a, in an op-ed I, I, I wrote the, early in the year, I call it the, the lost half decade, uh, in the period 2015-2019, in which the Latin American economies uh, uh, grew by only by 0.2%. And also, very importantly, the fiscal space uh, was much more limited than uh, in the face of 2008 crisis. And that has limited the capacity of governments to uh, increase financing. Uh, 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 and this is a problem that will remain for next year. So this is the, uh, the pandemic, the, uh, the cases for million inhabitants. Latin America is really bad on, uh, together with the US and Spain. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, you see the quinquennial, the, the last half decade, uh, almost zero growth. Uh, you can see this is much worse than all the previous quinquenniums uh, of poor performance uh, in history. Uh, and in terms of fiscal space, uh, the, uh, the, capa the, uh, the Latin America reached a crisis with fiscal deficits, uh, very different from 2008, uh, when it actually reached a crisis with fiscal surpluses and was able to expand uh, government spending in a significant way. So the, the, in terms of performance, uh, uh, this year uh, is going to be uh, very bad. Latin America is competing with Western Europe and India uh, at the worst performing regions of the world. Uh, is the worst recession for Latin American history. Uh, and given the, the previous uh, quinquennium, uh, it's going to experience uh, a lost decade, uh, which I define as 2015, 2024, uh, with, with terrible social outcomes. You can see here, this is the latest IMF projections. Uh, so the uh, Latin America is eight, a contraction of 8% 8, 8 of GDP, uh, excuse me, Latin America, similar to Western Europe, and a little better than, than India. Uh, well, I, I'll skip this. Uh, it's uh, different by countries. Uh, the worst uh, being uh, 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 Argentina, uh, Ecuador, uh, uh, Peru, and Venezuela. And you see here the, the, the recovery next year is going to be partial. So Latin America will only reach 2019 levels uh, in 2022, uh, 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 and, uh, and with a, a bit of doubts about it. You see, this is the performance this year. Uh, so this is the same graph before, but with the uh, estimate for 2019, you can say, well, it, there is a recovery expected for 2021. Uh, and in terms of social outcomes, you can see here that the, uh, uh, the poverty levels, and, and you can say inequality is the same, uh, was already uh, uh, worsening uh, during the previous quinquennium, uh, but this year uh, it's going to worsen significantly. Uh, ECLAC estimates uh, 45 million additional poor, uh, uh, which actually brings Latin America to levels uh, uh, like 2005, 2006. Uh, so it's a, it's a retrogression of about 15 years in terms of social development. Thank you very much. Luis, uh, it's your turn. Uh, thanks, Evan, and thanks uh, as well, uh, Maria Rosa, for the invitation to uh, to participate in this uh, in this panel. Very happy to uh, be able to share some of the views that we have for the region at uh, at JP Morgan. Let me start by you know trying to uh, establish a bit of the global context because I think that is important to uh, to understand you know why Latin America is uh, is underperforming in a way. Um, what we have seen so far this year, I mean, a lot of the, the, the dynamics were already explained by uh, Jose Antonio. We had a synchronized decline all over the world in the, in the second quarter of the year, and then uh, a synchronized rebound in the, in the third quarter. And uh, uh, since the fourth quarter of this year, that's when we're going to start to see quite a bit of divergence uh, across the world. And, uh, and a lot of the divergence is going to be driven partly by initial conditions. So countries that had more of a slack, a more ability to deploy more fiscal resources or to, to ease monetary policy further uh, and have or have a more effective <laughs> strategy to contain the, the, 
the impact of the virus obviously doing better uh, than those that had much more limited policy space or or uh, didn't have much success in their in their uh, anti-covid uh, strategy and um, and the reality is that you know for 2021 we're going to be asking a little bit of the same questions and i think that uh, a lot of the performance is going to be driven by how fast we can get a, an effective vaccine uh, being uh, broadly distributed and uh, and uh, and for people to take it, you know, before we can all feel comfortable and confident resuming activities uh, uh, and, and to start to see a lot more normalization of uh, economic activity around the world. You know, that I think is going to be a very patchy process and, uh, and we cannot count on, on that happening in a uniform way across the world for sure. Just to share with you a little bit of what uh, we're expecting uh, from the from the vaccine, I think that that is an important ingredient, and we're all going to be uh, paying very close attention. Certainly, over the past week, we have gotten some positive news on that front. Uh, the Pfizer announcement that they have, uh, you know, confirmed effectiveness uh, in a very high uh, percentage for uh, the vaccine that they are developing is obviously good news. Uh, but you can still say, well, it's good news maybe for the countries, the U.S. or 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 the countries that are in Europe uh, uh, that are going to be maybe first in line to get access to this vaccine. Um, we have had a discussion internally with our economists just to get a sense of, okay, you know, how to reflect this in our own projections. So a lot of the numbers that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, they don't have yet uh, incorporated uh, the, the, the development of a uh, distribution of a vaccine in a in a in a broad way, uh, but that is something that you know we're we're going to need to be doing uh, uh, soon. So the the expectation is that you know maybe by in the first quarter we're going to have obviously massive production. Second quarter is going where some of the more you know critical uh, uh, groups are going to have. Uh, uh, to to be taken in you know healthcare uh, workers uh, uh, etc and then uh, the uh, in the second half of the year 2021 that's when you may see the rest of the population across the US you know getting access to it in the case of Europe maybe the timeline is something similar assuming that uh, either the Pfizer or other vaccines that are showing some promise you know have a bit of the same timeline the question is when will the emerging world uh, uh, start to see this and the expectation is that it's not going to be contemporaneous Certainly, if you look at the Pfizer vaccine itself, you know, to transport it, it requires um, uh, uh, transportation facilities of minus 70 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, this is even a, a more, uh, a, 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 I mean, colder than the, than the uh, North Pole. So, you know, to be able to get it to the, uh, to the developing countries in a, in a, in a, massive way you know it is uh, it is more of an open question so uh, that's why you know it is possible that 2021 may not yet be uh, the year in which you're going to see a massive distribution and vaccination of populations uh, across uh, uh, the EM regions, including Latin America. And that is why it is, I think, too premature to start incorporating into growth projections uh, in EM the, the, the wide availability of a, of a vaccine. Let me show you some slides uh, in order to, uh, if you can please go to slide number three. The number is in the bottom of the slide. So that's slide number one. Thank you. So, you know, one, the first message is uh, that uh, this uh, recovery is quite incomplete. Uh, and if you look at the projections that we had for growth at the beginning of 20, uh, 2020, so before, right before the pandemic, and where we are right now, we're basically expecting that growth in the world by the end of next year is going to be 3.8 percentage points below what we were expecting pre-pandemic. And if you start to scroll down in the last column of this table, and I apologize for so many numbers, but I just wanted to make the point that trying to situate Latin America in this, in, in this context, you can see that Latin America, unfortunately, across the three EM regions, it is the one that is gonna be faring the worst. 
by the end of next year, we're going to have 7.6 percentage points uh, of, uh, of output below what we were projecting pre-pandemic. So, uh, so basically, that gives you a sense of you know, how incomplete this recovery is going to be. Many Latin American countries are not going to come back to where they were pre-pandemic in terms of output. You know, uh, certainly not next year. You know, in some cases, it will be 2022. In some other cases, it will be 2023. So that gives you a sense of you know, the lost output, the lost opportunity. And of course, along the way, there's a lot of employment uh, a, a, a lost uh, a lot of income lost uh, that uh, that obviously is, is going to be generating quite a bit of uh, of hardship. Um, the because of this incomplete recovery, we're going to see the maintenance, generally speaking, of a very uh, expansionary monetary policy. So central banks around the world are probably going to keep interest rates very low. That is probably the good news, and that is maybe an opportunity for. Uh, Latin America to uh, be able to keep accessing capital markets at rather you know cheap uh, uh, borrowing costs to the extent that there's going to be you know some capital flows that are going to be attracted just just for for the sake of capturing a little bit of higher yields than the ones that are going to be prevailing in uh, in, in in the developed world uh, but uh, uh, of course you know we need to see some recovery uh, starting to 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 take hold in the emerging world including Latin America for capital to feel comfortable and confident uh, coming back uh, in a big way to the to the region that is on the monetary policy side. On the fiscal side, that is the other part that is, at, I think, at this stage more of a question mark. And if we can just jump to slide number seven, mark number seven in the bottom. You can see there that uh, part of the growth uh, fiscal thrust is basically how much of the fiscal impulse, how much of growth can be attributed to fiscal policy. And the one policy response that we saw across the world, including interestingly enough, Latin America, was that uh, to the extent that when we were all sent home in a lockdown, quarantines, uh, uh, curfews, etc., around the world, uh, there was, of course, a collapse in private spending, both consumption and investment went down. Many governments tried to compensate the decline in private spending by increase, increasing public spending and try to therefore cushion the impact of the pandemic on growth. And to the extent that they extended uh, uh, spending so much, you had a positive contribution of growth. If we try to put a number to it, you can say that in 2020, 3.8 percentage points of growth for the for the entire world came from fiscal policy, it came from governments spending more. And if you scroll down, you can see that Latin America was an active participant in this trend. 4.5 percentage points of growth in Latin America uh, uh, is coming from fiscal policy. The problem is that you cannot sustain this level of spending forever, partly because it is expensive, partly because the market does not allow you, is not willing to finance you as much. And that is why in 2021, we're basically projecting that as much as fiscal policy contributed to growth this year, is going to be taking away, detracting from growth, providing a drag to growth in 2021. At the aggregate level, 2.1 percentage points, if we scroll down to Latin America, America, 3.7 percentage points is going to be taken away from growth in LATAM because of fiscal tightening. Now, if is, uh, monetary conditions remain so supportive and, and, uh, and, and there's this you know, search for yield that I mentioned, maybe many EM uh, uh, economies, including Latin American ones, could continue to have easy access to markets and that, that may uh, prevent governments from being forced to tighten uh, fiscal policy. But that is, uh, I would say, uh, an open question. And, and of course, you know, it, it, it depends also on a, on, a, on a choice. And there's countries, for example, Mexico, that probably has a lot more room to issue more debt and to spend more, and is deciding just not to do it. So a lot of that is going to be a policy choice. One last thing that I want to say in these initial remarks, if I can please uh, uh, go to uh, slide uh, uh, 10. Again, I apologize for so many numbers, but if you see in the bottom uh, right uh, uh, table on in this uh, slide, you can see the projections that we have for Latin America. And this is a message uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that in also quantifies a bit of what uh, uh, Jose Antonio mentioned. So if you look at the declining growth that we're seeing across the region this year, pretty much no country is going to fully reverse it in 2021. And you have uh, uh, you know, various degrees of, uh, of, uh, of, of recovery. Uh, uh, and uh, so 
this is going to be the, the, the challenge for the region that uh, unfortunately there's gonna be a destruction of production capacity. Potential growth is most likely going to continue to decline. It's already been declining in recent years pre-COVID. So not everything, the, the, um, for the, the bad fortunes of the region on so many fronts, you cannot all blame it on, on COVID, so, but COVID certainly is accentuating you know, some, some, some bad dynamics. So the hope is, and I say that as a hope because you know, it's, uh, it's, we don't have any, any, any evidence pointing to the contrary, uh, is that uh, you know in the years ahead, you know governments across the region will look for ways to try to enhance growth uh, by looking at uh, uh, second uh, generation reforms, trying to enhance productivity and the like. Uh, but um, uh, you know, if at this stage, there's not even this kind of discourse going uh, across the region. Uh, most countries are, of course, in in uh, still in emergency mode, trying to contain the impact of uh, of COVID, and that is what is taking most of the you know policy discourse. And, 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 and efforts, but uh, uh, you know, 2021 should be the year in which, uh, when the vaccine uh, uh, exists and it starts to get distributed, I think that the mindset of the private sector, we're all going to be comfortable at least seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. But it will be important for the region to hopefully start to reembark once again in reforms in order to capture the upswing that we're going to be seeing around the world in growth. I think that there are so many things uh, to comment about. You know, the realignment of uh, of supply chains uh, moving uh, away from China. You know, the situation between China and the US is probably not gonna get much better, which means that there could be an opportunity for some countries to try to capture some realignment of uh, supply chains. But uh, Latin America, for it to be attracting these flows, uh, is gonna need to probably, you know, pursue further reforms. And that is the part that I would say at this stage, at least is very unclear whether it will happen. Let me stop there and uh, engage in our, in our discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. I see that Brian has joined us. Brian, um, yeah, if you could, uh, you could uh, do your introductory remarks about ten minutes or so, and then we'll have a panel discussion afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you much, so much for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, what a what a time to be doing this, right? I mean, uh, nobody, no, as they say in Brazil, no one dies of boredom, um, especially these days. Um, my message today is one of relative optimism. Uh, I know that I have many friends here. Uh, I have been following Latin America. I'm, I'm from Texas, but I've been following the region for more than 20 years as a journalist, a writer, and a political analyst. Uh, 10 of those years spent living in the region. I lived in Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and Mexico City. And on the one hand, you know, I've never heard as much pessimism uh, about the region as I do right now. Uh, the motives are obvious, and I know that we've already talked about them during this panel. What I'd like to do is perhaps bring a bit of, of relative optimism to the discussion and talk about what I see as, as kind of the, the real reasons for that. Uh, and it basically has to do with the fact that Latin America is cyclical. And it's always been a region of ups and downs. And what I've seen in my time following the region is that when it's up, Everybody invents reasons why it's going to be up forever. And when it's down, the opposite is also true. People think of reasons to basically why Latin America is broken and the perspectives will never improve. And certainly my experience shows otherwise. To tell a very brief personal story, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about the year 2002. Uh, at the time, I was in Argentina as a very young reporter. Of course, everybody here knows what a terrible years those were for Argentina, economic crisis, five presidents in two weeks, unemployment of 25 to 30% in many ways worse than the current crisis. You had the freeze on bank deposits, the Corralito. Um, I lost $3,000 in the Corralito, which you know was a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money now, but you can imagine how much it was to a 22 year old um, reporter. But those were tough times, not just for Argentina, but for the rest of Latin America. Uh, you had in Colombia, these were the months pre previous to the election of Alvaro Uribe with the FARC on the doorstep of Bogota and the government had only a couple weeks worth of cash on hand to pay government workers. Brazil was going through a financial crisis with the imminent election of Lula. Peru was going through its kind of post Fujimori torpor. Uh, things had not yet begun to get better. Mexico was realizing that having gotten rid of the PRI was not kind of a magical answer to all its problems. And anyway, my point is, as recently as 2002, people thought that the 2000s were going to be a lost decade. And what came instead was, you know, the best 
decade, economically and socially speaking, in the modern history of the region. And I know that a lot of that was because of China. Uh, and sometimes when I, when I, back in the days when I used to kind of speak to live audiences about this, I would see people roll their eyes at that part. But I, I'm also a firm believer that China was only part of the story. Uh, a big part of the boom of the 2000s of that period from 2003 to 2013 that was so golden was also about the reforms that had been done in the 80s and 90s that allowed for the stabilization of the financial system, redemocratization of, of most of the region, and also the social programs that allowed for that income to be distributed uh, in a better way. And if there's one thing that drives me crazy, especially in the current context about the current debate uh, in Latin America is when we think about the good times, um, people have rewritten history as if Latin America was a passive observer in the best period in its modern history, when it's just not true. Uh, we know that those reforms played a major role. And so uh, to me, you know, the question that we have to ask ourselves now is, is there some other, is there something else out there you know, the equivalent of those reforms whose importance people didn't fully appreciate thereabouts in 2002 that should make us relatively optimistic about the current context now. Um, I don't think it's on the political side. And I, you know, those reforms that I'm mentioning are, they were the product of good leadership from um, leaders like uh, Ricardo Lagos and Fernando Enrique Cardoso and Ernesto Zedillo and kind of the bureaucratic class that stabilized um, you know, inflation and, and stabilize the banking system more broadly during that period. Uh, the bad news is that, and I'm, I'm sort of, even this, I'm, I'm putting it mildly, I don't see a Ricardo Lagos in the current group of presidents in Latin America. I just don't. I don't think the quality of leadership at the presidential level is uh, that good right now. But I do see, uh, you know, I, I talk about five reasons for optimism, and I'll go through these quickly so that we can get to the question and answer uh, part of this session. But, you know, if I th try to think of five reasons for optimism, um, you know, the first one, and I think the most important one would be uh, the dramatic increase in university enrollment that Latin America has seen over the last 20 years or so. Um, this, by the way, this is especially pronounced in some of the Andean countries like Peru, uh, Colombia and, uh, and Ecuador and, and Chile as well. Um, uh, the percentage of uh, young adults enrolled in higher education went from 19% in 1991 to 40% in 2010. Uh, no other region in the world had that kind of growth. And the bonus or rather the results of that investment should, that generation really is only now coming of age. Um, and it should pay a dividend in years to come, especially in the area of productivity, which all everybody here knows has been the big challenge for Latin America over the last 40 years or so. Most economists believe that productivity has been stagnant during that time. And I know, and as a matter of fact, this is at the center, I understand of the current political crisis in Peru. I know that there are questions about the quality of that education. Okay, in some cases, but um, still, I think it's uh, I, it, it still marks an improvement over where we be where we were before. Um, the second reason for optimism, you know, I think about the penetration of mobile technology and the possibility of kind of leapfrogging leapfrogging certain stages of development uh, for fintech. Um, the uh, the third one is um, I do think that there is good uh, leadership not at the presidential level but with mayors and governors, we can talk about that maybe in a little more detail later. I think that low interest rates globally could be a boon for Latin America as um, you know, investment kind of moves around the world in search of higher yields in, yield in years to come as we recover from the pandemic. And then the fifth and final reason, this is another one where people kind of roll their eyes at me sometimes, but I do see an improvement in values um, in the private sector, in the business world. I see a greater emphasis on uh, not just ESG, um, ethics and sustainable government, but I see uh, a business class that in certain corners has realized that politics is too important to leave to politicians um, and is getting more involved. I see, for example, in Brazil, I see the business class talking about pressuring on the Amazon really um, for the first time uh, in a sincere way, uh, knowing that the Bolsonaro government's actions 
aren't enough and that it's a risk to their own well-being if they let that stand. I also see in countries all over the world growth in kind of the ethics and business compliance part of the business as uh, in large part uh, a response to uh, Lava Jato and the other crises of the 2010s. So, you know, I mean, in summary, I these days I describe myself as more as a political analyst. Uh, but I think that even as a political analyst, it's important to remind ourselves that politics isn't everything uh, when it comes to both life and kind of the development of countries. And so I think if you're going to look for reasons for optimism out, I think you have to go outside of politics right now and look at some of these other factors. I know that in the, in the Andean region in particular, I, I'm, I, I'm even more optimistic about those countries than I am about places like Mexico and Argentina, which I think are going to continue to be problematic in years to come. So I, I, in, in, in conclusion, that's a, you know, that's a somewhat optimistic case, relatively speaking. Um, but it's it's based in in facts, and again, 20 years having followed all this, being aware of the fact that there's always ups and downs, and somehow we always seem to forget that when when things get especially dark. Great. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, so um, right now we're going to have a panel discussion, uh, and then uh, afterwards, please, uh, the audience, please use the Q and A function because uh, we'll take uh, questions from you. So. Um, so I'm a glass half full type of guy as well. Um, so I think there are, you know, definitely reasons for optimism. Um, but I just wanted to, to um, sort of focus the discussion looking backwards for a second, not necessarily forwards, uh, not to burst the bubble, but a common theme on Luis and Jose Antonio's um, presentation was that COVID had affected Latin America worse than other regions, in particular, uh, EM regions, regions which which have some of the same issues, um, and uh, you know, COVID has affected uh, globally. So I wanted to see, understand why you think that had had a disproportionate impact on Latin America. And I'll, I'll start with uh, with Jose Antonio first, and maybe we can look at those the re those reasons and see what um, what policy prescriptions. Are obviously a pandemic is impossible to predict, and nobody could have predicted it. But um, I think the comparative perspective may shed some light on some of the particular structural challenges that exist in Latin America. So, uh, Jose Antonio, if you can address that. Yeah. Uh, well, let me let me say the. Uh, uh, the uh, I mean, first of all, the uh, the uh, the pandemics uh, hit Latin America very hard. I mean, we uh, we were the epicenter of the pandemic, let's say, from June to August. Uh, it's improving now, but uh, it, it, I mean, we could discuss why why uh, it was so strong, uh, even in countries that uh, you would not have expected, let's say, Chile, for example. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that's one point. Uh, but the other point, which I uh, was in my presentation, uh, is actually that the, the period of fast growth that Brian was mentioning was already over five years before the, the current crisis. Uh, so the, uh, I mean, the boom of commodity prices, which was the base for the uh, South American uh, period of fast growth, uh, it was over by 2014, 2015. Uh, and Mexico had never been uh, very dynamic anyway. Uh, and, and I think the, uh, my, my point is that we, we, this crisis hit Latin America uh, after five years of very poor performance. Uh, and therefore, the uh, the, the uh, space to uh, to do things uh, was quite limited, including the fiscal area. For example, in Luis, uh, 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 data for for the fiscal uh, effects, I think uh, that is uh, significantly affected by Brazil, uh, because Brazil is one of the countries that has. I mean, you can say there are three countries that have had strong fiscal policies: uh, uh, Chile, Peru, and Brazil, uh, uh, and I mean expansionary fiscal policies. Uh, and, uh, and Brazil actually not because of the government, because of Congress, uh, because Congress is the one that, uh, in a sense, over read, over over uh, overread the uh, uh, the uh, the more orthodox uh, perspective of the Minister of Finance of, of Brazil, uh, by they decide that you know to expand uh, you know the uh, support to households uh, to poor households in a significant way, actually uh, even reducing poverty levels uh, uh, during the crisis. Anyway, that, but that's, a, that's very peculiar. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, I think if you take out Brazil, 
uh, the, uh, the the fiscal thrust uh, that uh, Luis was presenting was probably very limited. Actually, his, his numbers, Mexico is, of course, a very bad case, uh, uh, almost no fiscal expansion. Anyway, so the, uh, the capacity to do expansionary fiscal policies uh, it had been very limited. Uh, and Brazil did it uh, uh, actually largely because the Brazil does have a very high public sector debt, but it's domestically financed uh, to, a, to a significant extent. It doesn't depend so much of, of uh, uh, capital markets, which other countries in the region do. Uh, so that's, a, that's my, my mix is uh, the pandemics, which hit us hard. Uh, and, and second, that we, uh, we came on top of five years of poor performance, which maybe when we talk about the, the future and policies, uh, I, I think what that implies in my view. So I don't know if Luis, you have anything to add. There was a, a comment from from someone named Anonymous who said that um, that uh, you know the 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 the, the uh, uh, hitting Latin America particularly hard was because of the large uh, size of the informal sector, which is obviously um, obviously true. Although I you know I I wonder whether the size of the informal sector is is uh, bigger than in other uh, regions of sub-Saharan Africa or some parts of Asia. But in any event, I don't know whether you have anything else to add, uh, Luis. Well, so to the to the factors that uh, Jose Antonio mentioned, you know, clearly I would, uh, I actually meant to, to, to bring up, you know, the, the informality that exists uh, in so many of these economies. And, uh, and I think that, uh, okay, maybe uh, you know, we shouldn't be comparing us to even poorer countries in Africa. We should be comparing us to, you know, so, you know countries in Asia or, or in EMEA where, you know, we, you don't have this kind of situation. And, you know, what, what uh, I think that uh, when we think about, you know, why Latin America has been on a declining growth trend for, for you know, uh, at least half a decade, you know, beyond the end of the commodity super cycle that uh, Jose Antonio mentioned, it was the fact that, you know, the, the region, you know, for so many years had underinvested in infrastructure. So the infrastructure quality is very poor. And part of that infrastructure is also the health infrastructure. So, you know, the, 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 the region, I think, was ill prepared to, to handle a situation with a pandemic. And because of the informality, the, the capacity of governments to reach out and to actually help those that were being affected or the population that uh, didn't have a formal job ended up being quite severely impaired, you know. So, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm Peruvian and it was, uh, you know, incredible to see, you know, Peru adopted one of the most stringent, you know, uh, 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 curfews combined with, you know, quarantines. Uh, I mean, the lockdown measures were quite extreme. That had a huge impact on growth, yet because of the informality uh, of the economy, 70% of, of uh, the labor force, you know, for the most part works in the informal sector. Well, guess what? You know, they had to go out to earn a living. They live on a day to day. Uh, so we could not, uh, you know, just lock people up for three months and expect them to survive. Uh, so, you know, it, it is these kind of situations that I think in the end, uh, made that Latin America stand out as the as the as the worst affected region. It was already underperforming before, and I think that COVID, in a way, laid bare a lot of the reasons why it was underperforming and made them even worse. Unfortunately, thank you. I don't know, Brian, whether you you know if we we can segue into uh, and enough of being pessimistic. So I mean, you're you're the optimist. Um, you know what? specific policy prescriptions uh, do you think, you know, in, I mean, we can sort of put it into two buckets. I, you know, obviously, you know, there's long-term um, uh, issues and then uh, sort of the more immediate um, into the next year, whether it's fiscal policy, monetary policy, and what do you think is the right mis mix in the, in the short and the long-term? Yeah, that's a tough question, but I, I, you know, I would start by saying that what perhaps ties many of these factors that we're talking about from informality and slow growth and onward, you know, it, it may be no accident that the world's most unequal region is also the region of the world hardest hit by COVID-19, not only in terms of the, the health and human cost in terms of lives, but in terms of uh, the economics as well. And, you know, inequality is certainly not a new issue in Latin America. Uh, it is, was certainly at the heart of the economic uh, relative underperformance as well as 
the social conflicts of, of the 20th century, certainly the second half of the 20th century. Um, but there are some things going on right now that, that make it even more unsustainable than it was before. Uh, everything from uh, the social networks that, you know, somebody told me at, at the height of the, the crisis last year in October in, in Chile, they said, you know, part of the issue is that Instagram now shows us how the Kim Kardashian of Chile uh, lives. Uh, you know, it takes us behind those walls and shows us those things in a way that it never did before. I don't profess to know who exactly the Kim Kardashian of Chile is, but I think the point um, remains the same. And, um, you know, the other big factor is the growth of the middle class by, depending on how, where you draw the line and whose estimate you're taking, at least 50 million people in the 2000s, those are people who came out of poverty and and now they want more. And then you add to that the fact that we know that inequality is going to grow even further um, because of COVID-19, not just the short-term inequality that comes from job losses, but the long-term inequality that comes from what will be an enduring loss to education um, in many, most, well, no, really all countries, including this one, uh, including the United States. Um, so I think it's going to become even more not only contentious in years to come, but that will cause all the economic problems uh, that we know that inequality brings from low trust in societies, uh, which then is a contributing factor to low investment, um, low growth, and so on. Your question, though, was about like what do we do? What do we do about it? And I think that you know I think it's a mix of of politics and economics. It will probably come as no surprise that I'm going to focus on the politics because we have um, you know a wealth of economic knowledge on this panel that perhaps others are better prepared to speak to. I personally believe that you know I think back to what the first lady of Chile said at the height of the protest last October, where she was you know, an audio message that she recorded to a friend um, was leaked to the press in which she said, obviously, from the perspective of somebody, um, you know, a wealthy member of society, she said, you know, we have to open ourselves up and share our privileges. And um, I think that's going to be the baseline for economic reforms as well over the next couple of years. And I I, I don't, uh, you, you describe me as an optimist, but on that policy front, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'm optimistic about the possibility for reform because um, let's just say I've participated in some other forums lately in which, you know, Latin America's elites are talking again about socialism, you know, and I, well, maybe I'll just leave it there for yeah, now. Well, but I, um, some, some, some would say some elites in the United States have been talking about it as well, but um um but um yeah uh, that's a that's a fair uh, a fair point i mean um it, it, you know jose antonio luis in terms of policies you know luis i know um uh, you know as an economist um uh you may um there's no maybe no such thing as the long term but um or or uh <laughs> or uh, not not to quote Keynes, but what what would you see as sort of the right mix over the next uh over the next year or two in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy? Well, monetary policy, I think, is going to remain rather, you know, expansionary, low interest rates uh, pretty much everywhere. Inflation, fortunately, is not a problem in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, the destruction of uh, demand that we just discussed, the fact that the recovery is going to be incomplete, output gaps are going to remain negative. So it, I just don't see where inflation pressures will be coming from. Uh, which means the central banks can keep interest rates low. Fiscal policy is more problematic because it remains, uh, you know, it, it would be, you know, the only the countries that uh, have room to, uh, to 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 finance it. Uh, Jose Antonio mentioned, you know, in Latin America, Chile, uh, Peru, and, and Brazil stood out as, as exceptions. Other other countries, you know, uh, uh, Colombia, you know, couldn't. Uh, Mexico could but didn't. Uh, 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 and Argentina couldn't either. So um, uh, that, that, that was uh, what, what marked the difference and it may not be too different uh, uh, next year. I'd like to refer back to you know, something that Brian mentioned. Uh, I think that you know that when, when we talk about informality, you know, oftentimes we link it to you know maybe it's high taxes or difficult to pay taxes and that's why people prefer to be in the informal economy. But 
I think that uh, you know part of the 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 agenda for for you know many countries in Latin America for the future is that you know you have these two economies that are some almost like coexisting, and that uh, you know and there's a there's a social element to it, there's an economic element, and certainly a political element to it. You know when I see in my own country, you know who are the people protesting against, for example, the development of of the mining sector, right, on mines and and mega projects that could have brought a lot of capital, all of a sudden get stalled. You know who why is it not possible with all this money to convince you know uh, uh, presumably that those protesting are the are the people around the mines that, that would be affected because of the water supplies etc well guess what a lot of that is that in there is a huge informal mining sector in Peru right and uh, and 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 and, and and there's got to be an effort to, I don't know, try to formalize it, you know, try to bring everyone in the same umbrella uh, uh, so that you don't have these kind of clashes. You know, unfortunately, you know, partly because of lack of vision, partly because of, you know, I'm sure, you know, private interests, uh, there is never a true, you know, effort of, of reconciling these informal and formal economies and the two are bound to continue to clash and the two are bound to, you know, impair, you know, reforms and uh, so, and, and this shows up uh, in composition of Congress, this shows up in, you know, who gets elected. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the in the in the in the year ahead you know there's a second generation economic reforms that are in the agenda but i think that there's a lot of political reform that needs to also be done you know in order to try to bring these two worlds together otherwise i think that we're going to be hostage to these clashes uh, in the years and decades ahead if uh, if nothing gets done jose antonio i don't know I, I i may have cut you off was there something you wanted to add uh, yes, but well, I, I totally agree that monetary policy uh, are going to be uh, continue to be expansionary. Uh, I mean, the uh, one advantage for Latin America, as I pointed out, and, and Luis also, is that the, uh, there will be uh, some capital flows, uh, financing uh, 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 on relatively cheap basis, uh, 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 as well as the capacity to, uh, to do domestic financing at relatively low cost for governments. Uh, so that that part. Uh, now the fiscal. Well, let me say on the. Uh, on, uh, in my view, there has to be a, a, a set of reforms. I mean, not necessarily the second generation uh, that we used to discuss a few years ago. But I mean, one good thing is is uh, that how are we going to support uh, poor households? Uh, I think this crisis has been good in that regard. Uh, we have, you know, all countries have learned. Uh, how to uh, to support poor households in a better way, uh, and uh, and there's, there's going to be a legacy of that, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, also in health. I mean, because of the of the needs of the pandemic. So I think the the there, there are going to be social reforms, uh, some of which uh, may come out of the intervention during the crisis. Uh, I I I think the, uh, the the two complicated issues uh, are the. Uh, 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 you know what to do on the economic uh, reform area, uh, and in my view, uh, I think we we have. I mean, the governments have to uh, to push for you know pro, you know production sector policies again uh, to push uh, depending on the country or the capacities or the, or the agricultural sector or the manufacturing or uh, some services that can, particularly those that can be uh, exporting sectors, uh, uh, which is a, you know a, a, an important issue. Uh, and, and the association with science and technology, which Latin America is, uh, is far behind, uh, with few exceptions, Brazil being, of course, the major exception uh, in terms of the development of the science and technology system. So that's that's my let's say my, my mix of social and economic agenda. The uh, uh, and this has to be with the problem of, of financing. I mean, certainly, for example, as Luis pointed out, uh, the issue of infrastructure is terrible in uh, in many Latin American countries. I mean, perhaps the financing in cheap terms uh, will help, uh, but there has to be uh, a, a, a strong push uh, in terms of spending as well as for social policies of, and science and technology, let's say. And, and so the, the idea that somehow, uh, you know, the increase or the, the deficits or, or the increase in spending that has taken place uh, in, in countries uh, will, will be easily reversible is not true. Uh, I think the, there, is, there has to be a commitment to an increase in, uh, in public sector spending, which in my view uh, requires uh, thinking about the tax reforms uh, that will have to be adopted in order to finance uh, a larger uh, public sector. 
I always want to end. Before we go to um, to Q and A, and I think there may be some poli uh, poli more political questions to to engage Brian a little bit more as well. Uh, just um, I, I uh, taking my prerogative and, and moderating my interest. Just a follow up for always, Antonio. I mean, in your slides, it, you know, it was it was obvious that the uh, it, and you mentioned the 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 obviously need for financing and infrastructure. But uh, in 2020, you know, the financing needs have been, by and large been taken up by, by the private sector, right? By bond offerings, uh, private lending, searching for yield in a relatively low interest rate environment, um, and not by multilateral uh, lending. Um, is, do, you, do, you, do you view that trend to continue? And if so, how could really the structural reforms, reforms be undertaken if, uh, basically, you know, the spending is being done with money that doesn't necessarily have conditionality attached to it. Uh, I, I, I really think the, uh, you know, private sector financing to, uh, to several countries or actually to most countries in Latin America uh, is going to continue because that's, that's, in a sense, in my view, an effect of the expansionary monetary policies of the United States, <laughs> uh, which is what generating that phenomenon. So I, I I mean, the, the real question is whether the multilateral system uh, uh, will, uh, will adopt, a, you know, a stronger policies uh, to support the social development and, and economic growth. I mean, it's a big question mark. Now, in Latin America, we basically depend on two, uh, you know, I had a slide that just went very rapidly through, but we depend on two uh, multilateral banks, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and the... Uh, uh, and the and CAF, the old Andean Development Corporation, which is now called the Development Bank of Latin America, uh, the uh, uh, and, and and in my view, both have to be capitalized because otherwise they cannot contribute uh, uh, as much to the to the recovery. Actually, Central America does have the advantage that the Central American Integration Bank, which is of course important for them, uh, uh, was capitalized uh, well uh, early this year. Uh, but the other two are not. And in the in the case of the Inter-American Development Bank, it's also uh, a hostage to the uh, political uh, conflicts in the United States, because uh, the, the, I mean the constraint there is whether the United States Congress uh, is willing to approve a, a you know a significant capitalization of the Inter-American Development Bank. And in the case of CAF, uh, it's basically the budgets of Latin of the member countries uh, and whether they can put money. Uh, into the capitalization of CAF. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't there's, know. there's a good prospect, uh, and there are prospects that could, I mean, if, if anything, the situation of the multilaterals cannot be worse than this year because they have contributed very little this year. Yeah, although, I mean, in, in, in the context of the debt re, uh, negotiation and restructurings in, in, um, in Ecuador and, and in, um, to less extent in Argentina, they played a uh, a helpful role to facilitate uh, the restructurings. Uh, I think that's was probably the main the main focus uh, this year. Yeah, that's that's correct. What, what I would add to that, if I may, uh, is that uh, I think that uh, it, there we we detect very little appetite, not only in the U.S., not only in Washington, but also in European capitals uh, for you know in a world of COVID where clearly the fiscal resources are 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 the demands uh, are, are huge domestically to devote more resources to recapitalize multilateral development banks, right? I mean, maybe if the mindset in the US had been <laughs> different than the one that uh, drove uh, the Trump administration, maybe there could have been a bit more pressure to do it. But, uh, you know, it remains an open question whether a Biden administration would change that and, and push for recapitalization, push the Europeans or others, uh, Asian countries to, to, to chip in. But short of that, uh, you know, it's clear that uh, there's a bigger role for the private sector and there's a bigger role for more cooperation between multilaterals and the private sector in order to try to bring more capital to emerging markets, including uh, uh, Latin America. What is interesting is that, you know, some Latin American countries, you know, seem to be getting a little bit with a tomb that, you know, there could be an opportunity to try to capture some of the growing flows that are coming into these ESG funds, you know, more of these sustainable financing, responsible uh, investment uh, strategies. Uh, and, uh, 
and they're trying to you know re revamp their let's say public credit uh, teams or or you know investor relation teams so that they could be informing uh, uh, the market about you know whatever is happening on the ESG front in their own countries, uh, and maybe that uh, you know makes them uh, uh, more attractive for for this kind of uh, of, of flows. COVID is certainly, you know, we do detect, you know, increasing the interest among investors of, uh, of putting money uh, where there's a bit more of accountability of what is being, how the, this money is being used. And uh, Latin American countries can, you know, to the extent that they have massive needs, if they are, uh, you know, uh, transparent enough of how they're using their, these resources, they could be uh, attracting more capital flows through, uh, through these um, ESG or SDG funds. Thank you. Um, well, there's some great questions, so I'm going uh, to uh, read, uh, read them. I'll try to get uh, through all of them. Some of them we touched on in various respects, uh, but I want to hit on some first because I think uh, I think everybody will you know, want us to address some of the more political or foreign policy points. So just following up on something that, uh, that Louis said uh, is, uh, was a question. How do you see the impact of the new U.S. government? And uh, maybe the the, um, uh, the 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 question uh, didn't uh, specify who would be in the new U.S. government or top the new U.S. government. But how would how do you see the impact of the new U.S. government on Latin American politics and economic conditions? And Brian, if you could if you could start us off with that. Well, first of all, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Joe Biden. <laughs> um, and so uh, if we can sort of assume that as a baseline. Um, so look, I mean, a couple of things. I think that US interests in Latin America will remain largely the same. And I think the top priorities for a Biden administration will be largely the same as they were for the Trump administration. Uh, what will change most will be the tactics. And there's a few additional things that are very important as well. So, um, you know, when we think about the top priorities of the Trump administration, they were basically in no particular order immigration, uh, Venezuela, trade, and China. And I actually, on all four of those things, I don't see massive changes um, with the Biden administration. As a matter of fact, I think the biggest evolution that we've seen over the last four years in the Democratic Party has been with its views towards China uh, and the belief that Latin America specifically is um, much to my regret, by the way, they're likely to see, I think, or at least some of the people in the incoming administration are likely to see Latin America, again, as kind of a chessboard in that geopolitical conflict with, um, with China. That, of course, resuscitates memories of the Cold War and the dynamic from the last century, which I personally don't want to see a return to that. I know that leaders in South America in particular and the Andes and even more than that um, are I know for a fact, because I've had these conversations, politicians uh, wake up every morning terrified that at some point they'll have to choose between either Washington or Beijing, given you know the, the trade relationships that they have. Nobody wants to make that choice. It's not clear yet that they will absolutely have to, but this idea that somehow a Biden administration might lead back to sort of a 2013 view from Washington of what Beijing is, is all about, particularly with regards to its activities in Latin America, I think that's gone. I think that now there's a vision that's actually much closer to where Donald Trump has been over the last couple of years. I mentioned additional factors. I, I think they're clear, um, two of them in particular. The big one that's likely to drive policy towards the region and really the administration more broadly is climate change, which of course Donald Trump did not see as such a major factor, let's say. Um, that may be more important in the relationship with Brazil than it will be with the Andeans. Um, you know, obviously in the case of the Andean countries, even the, the arguably the most conservative government in the region, the one that was most aligned with Trump, which was the government, the Duque administration in Colombia, um, Ivan Duque believes in climate change and has taken concrete steps to uh, make sure it's addressed. So that one's less likely to, to kind of move things. The other big one, and, and for the Andean countries, I'm not sure that this is such a big one either, but I, I do believe that uh, concern over corruption and rule of law will move more front and center with the Biden administration than it was under the Trump administration, which was willing to kind of, in practice, put that aside, most notably with the whole case of Guatemala and Sisig back in 
2018, 2019, whenever that was, that they kind of allowed that to be uh, disassembled. So I think that'll be a change too. But broadly speaking, using broad strokes, I think there'll probably be less foreign policy impact from the change in government here on Latin America than on many, many other regions in the rest of the world. I was Antonio, Luis, do you care to comment? I, I, I was actually uh, writing today in Opet for a uh, Tiempo, the Colombian newspaper on the uh, interna uh, international agenda of the Biden administration. I'm, I'm actually a bit more optimistic than, than Brian. Uh, I thought his initial presentation was perhaps a bit too optimistic for my view. But on, on, on this, uh, I, I think the big change, uh, which is positive, uh, I mean, two big changes that I see uh, positive. Uh, the, the first one, uh, is that uh, you know uh, the Biden administration will believe in multilateralism, and I think that's a big step forward. Uh, you know, in climate change and uh, the, uh, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, the United Nations, uh, and, and probably in many areas of cooperation. Uh, for example, how to strengthen, uh, which is a major issue going forward, how to strengthen cooperation in the spread of the vaccine. Uh, when it's developed, for example, that's going to be a major uh, issue, and and I think the, uh, the the developed countries working with W uh, with the World Health Organization can play a, a, an important role. And the second major change I see uh, for Latin America uh, is that the agenda will become more diversified, uh, and, and perhaps I would add a, a bit less, uh, a, a bit more predictable, uh, which is good. Uh, let's say, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, I, I think when you look at the agenda of Latin America uh, with Latin America, the uh, Trump administration, uh, it was uh, uh, migration. And, and, and I, would, I would add, of course, for our countries, uh, narco-trafficking, narco-trafficking. And, and I think uh, uh, the, the agenda is going to be broader. I mean, you, you mentioned the rule of law, uh, but for example, for Colombia, the support to the peace process, uh, a, a clear, uh, which the Duque administration itself had been skeptical. Uh, it's, it's important, uh, the, the human rights issues that many countries have uh, are going to be in the agenda, which I think is a positive step. And so broadly speaking, I, I, I do, uh, and, the, and the other is actually uh, with Venezuela. I think with Venezuela, uh, the Biden administration may work more closely, uh, uh, even with, uh, uh, with, uh, with European countries to try to, uh, to work on the, on a more uh, negotiated outcome, uh, rather than the you know the periodic uh, uh, punches done, they say, oh military intervention or whatever, uh, which was very bad for for the uh, uh, relations uh, you know with Venezuela. I, I think it has to be a bit more predictable and based on negotiations because otherwise there is going to be no change. Thank you. Uh, Antonio. So if I could um, sort of shift uh, from international politics to domestic politics. So I'm going to try to, you know, given time, I'm going to try to combine a few questions and I apologize if, I, if uh, in doing so I sort of oversimplified or missed some of the nuance. But uh, there were a number of questions about domestic politics. One was to, if we could discuss uh, some of the presidential elections that were coming up in uh, 2021 in Ecuador, Colombia will be gearing up. Um, if you could discuss those, the impact that some candidates uh, who may be of a more, um, particularly in Colombia, maybe more Lula aligned uh, type of candidates um, could have on the on political risk and economic growth. Um, that's one part of the domestic political uh, scene. And, and also the other question deals with, um, you know, uh, to incidents of fragmentation where, where um, what you see in Peru and you see in other places where the governing bodies, uh, the legislature, the executive and the governing bodies just do not govern um, or do not work together to govern as opposed to what, what Brian opened with, with some of the successful governments in the early 2000s, which reached across aisles um, and, um, and govern. So the first part is, I, you know, perhaps Brian, you can go through some of the elections that are coming in 2021. And then the second part would be, do you see this trend of fragmentation? I mean, there's always been fragmented politics in Latin America, 
but where there's uh, you know divided government uh, that basically is you know leading things to standstills and not coming up with the policy solutions. Uh, do you see that trend is continuing? I'll be brief. I mean, starting first with Peru. Uh, of course, it's impossible to talk about Peru's election without talking about what happened this week. Um, and without getting into the, the finer details, you have to wonder how long this divorce between bad politics and good economics in Peru will last. Because it really is a case, I mean, in, in most respects from both a kind of a GDP perspective as well as a poverty reduction perspective, it's, it's the biggest South American success story over the last um, 17 or 18 years despite having some of the region's worst politics. And here again this week, you know, we saw those bad politics erupt, ironically taking down a Peruvian president with uh, an approval rating of better than 50%, which I always joke that having a 50% approval rating in Peru is like having a 130% approval rating in any other country because, you know, the history there is of having, in fact, it had the unique distinction of once having a president that or the, the economic GDP rate was higher than the president's popularity rate. It was, I think under Toledo, the economy grew like eight and Toledo was at like six. So it's mystifying, frankly, that that would happen now. But I, I wonder, you know, I see on Wall Street and elsewhere this assumption that people just ignore it. People just ignore the bad politics in Peru. And, mm, but if you start talking to the people who really know both the economic dynamics and the um, the political dynamics, they, those people right now are talking about 2021 with a degree of concern because there's a lot of uncertainty. All the major, all the major parties have been discredited. Nobody really knows who the favorite is. It might be this guy Forsyth, the, the Lima mayor who was a former soccer goalie for the national team. He's, he's running in first place right now, but nobody really knows what he stands for. So I think it's a it's a question mark. And then I haven't even mentioned the fact that it has the one of the world's the region's highest and one of the world's highest um, death rates, as well as uh, one of its big biggest recessions, biggest GDP contractions as a result. So that to me just just speaks to a whole range of destabilization. I think that people's assumptions about Peruvian politics, I think, need to be revisited. It's not the same as sounding the alarm and saying it's going to be a disaster. But I think we have to look at that 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 separation of kind of church and state, if you will, economics and, and politics and ask ourselves whether that's gonna hold. Um, Ecuador, I, I, I frankly am not a specialist on, so I, I may skip over that and just go to this question about, you know, what is there a Lula uh, in Colombia if we look ahead to 2022? Um, it depends on who we're talking about <laughs> because I, I don't see Petro, for example, as a Lula-like figure. Um, I think he has, my read is that he has more in common with um, with the harder left. Uh, and you know maybe you could argue, maybe the, the question came from somebody who was referring to, uh, to Fajardo, who's kind of more of a traditional center left figure uh, along the lines of what Lula ended up governing as at least during his, his most of his most of his eight years. Um, but I, that's another one where I you know, depending on which way the politics go and depending on who takes charge, I, I, I think merits merits attention. I, I know that in the class of candidates in 2018, uh, which was a year where you had elections, not just in Colombia, but Brazil, Mexico, and elsewhere, of all the candidates in all of those elections, the one that most worried people on Wall Street who were in the know was Gustavo Petro. So, um, you know, we'll see where that goes and, and whether it becomes a destabilizing factor in, in markets, even as we get into 2021. Was Antonio? I don't know whether uh, it hit, hits too close to home, but I, we wondered what your thoughts on the Colombian uh, election, or if you if you would prefer uh, uh, Peru or Ecuador, and, uh, and how you see oh, uh, how do you see these things uh, affecting economic Brian. I, I tend to agree with Brian in Col Colombia. I, I I think the future of Colombia is 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 centered uh, in, in, in politics. Uh, I don't think Pedro uh, or uh, a new uh, candidate of Uribe are going to make it next time. Anyway, we have to see. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, Peru was shocking, actually, uh, amazingly shocking this way. 
uh, for a president which I thought was a, a, looked like a good president from outside. Um, now, I, I think actually I'm optimistic about the prospects of Chile with the plebiscite and the new constitution. Uh, in, in Colombia, for example, in 1991, constitution was a very positive mo uh, movement. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I am optimistic. Uh, I'm actually my, my uh, most, uh, my stronger pessimism is actually for the two largest economies in politics. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, AMLO, uh, you don't know what to think about him. I mean, he's not a center, he's not a left president for sure uh, in, uh, in the way he governs. Um, and it's very unpredictable uh, in terms of the institutional setting uh, and, the, and the policies, let's say, uh, or, or the lack of policies, uh, I think it's, it's quite worrisome. Uh, and, and even, even his, uh, in, in both cases, well, and Bolsonaro, uh, actually in, in Brazil, actually the most positive force this year has been Congress, not the president. Uh, and, uh, and they have done interesting policies uh, for the crisis. Um, you know, maybe that's the that's the future. Uh, that's what the future in Brazil is going to look like. I mean, it's of course shocking to also to know that these are the only two presidents that have not recognized the victory of, of Biden uh, in in the U.S. elections. Uh, Luis, I know you're you're an economist, but. Uh... Well, how do you see you know the election cycle in terms of political risk and affecting economic growth? Well, certainly, you know the 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 countries that has that have elections uh, next year, uh, I think that there's the risk in all of them, and this is the risk that is shared with uh, you know so many so much of the of the world is you know the that it could be populist governments getting elected, right? The, the conditions are certainly ripe for it because of COVID and because of, in general, the sense of, uh, uh, the, we already mentioned, you know, the, the, the discontent with income inequality and that COVID is actually making worse uh, and, uh, and, um, and the need to come up with solutions, at least on, on, on paper that look easy. So it's gonna be rather easy to charm people with, you know, uh, uh, you know populist uh, proposals. Uh, let me just comment one by one, you know, well, in my own country, you know, certainly the, the events of this past week, you know, well, beyond embarrassing are, are, are very worrisome because, you know, this is the second president that gets, uh, uh, you know, um, basically removed or forced to, to leave, uh, interrupting uh, what had been in, you know, I, I do remember, you know, the, the case of, uh, of Toledo that uh, Brian mentioned, you know, it was seen by market participants as a demonstration of political maturity of Peruvians, that despite having such an unpopular president, uh, you know, there was no, of course, all kinds of ideas came, remember where, where Florida at that time, but, you know, Toledo, despite being so unpopular, he finished his term, right? And there was no interruption of constitutional order or anything like that. And the economy did well uh, uh, <laughs> throughout. Now we have a, a little bit of the opposite situation where, you know, a, a president that on paper was very popular, you know, ended up being uh, uh, a, a vacated. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, the precedents certainly are not good ones. And hopefully, I think what is massively needed in Peru clearly is a political reform. He has to put, you know, more clearer rules around how to interpret some of these, you know, key constitutional articles that give rise to this, you know, let's vote and kick the president out type of situations, right? So, because otherwise, uh, you know, there's gonna be no policy continuity in the years ahead if, if, if this kind of uh, practice uh, 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 continues. Uh, who could win in Peru? Honestly, the, 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 the room is wide open. I still see, you know, the leftist parties are quite fragmented, so, my, my, my inclination is to say, you know, more more centrist, but uh, the issue for 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 someone that you know that interacts with markets, it's no longer about right or left, right? It is about whether it is populist or more orthodox, and uh, populism is what is uh, uh, driving or, or raising the most concerns. Not whether because we have also right wing populism, and you can see how much damage it can it can it, it can do. Uh, one last point. I mean, there was a question about Ecuador. The one thing that enthuses me about Ecuador this time around is that you're seeing the the, the uh, Guayaquil, you know, or the the candidate from the coast not having. I mean, that vote not being split among uh, uh, various candidates, and uh, 
remains to be seen in a country that regionally is so polarized, uh, whether you can actually see for the first time, you know, some real uh, uh, debate. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we may actually have uh, some, some good news coming out of Ecuador in the, in the election next year. Okay, well, I think uh, let's, let's leave that on a positive note. I think we're running out of time. So, we, um, so I'd like to thank all the, uh, the panelists who did a wonderful job. Um, there may have been some questions we weren't able to address. If there, if, um, there are, if somebody feels uh, they'd like to ask one of us a question, please uh, do it through the uh, association. Uh, again, thank you very much for the privilege of uh, moderating this. I'm going to turn it back over to Maria Rosa. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, for the Indian American Associations, it has been an amazing, and really we appreciate the fact that you have accepted to do this outlook. Uh, you have dealt with a, with a huge topic and very difficult topic in a, a brilliantly. So I wanna thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose Antonio and Luis and Evan and Brian, it, it has been an, a pleasure to hear and the different points of views and the great questions from the audience. Uh, I also would like to thank our wonderful staff, uh, Linda Calvet, uh, Lina Delgado, Lauri Dominguez and Isabella Peña for making this event possible. Uh, just very shortly, next Thursday, the 19th, we're gonna have the Ecuadorian American Association will host uh, Ambassador um, Yvonne Abaki about um, the challenges and opportunities that uh, she has found in, in this uh, time while she has been an ambassador. So she's gonna have an interview. She's gonna be interviewed by Jose Maria Barrio Nuevo of uh, Bright Hill Capital. And before I let you go, just wanna remind you that we are a non-for-profit organization that we have been supporting this region for the last 93 years. So if you would like to be either a sponsor or a member, uh, at the end of our invitations, you will find a way to contact our team. Thank you so much to everyone for participating and looking forward so much to having you again. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you, Maria Rosa. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, Luis. Gracias. Ciao, Jose Antonio. Fantastico. Ciao. Gracias a todos. <laughs>